You're listening to a special edition Zweig Letter Podcast, putting architectural, engineering, planning, and environmental consulting guru Mark Zweig and his team of experts, Straight Talk, in your ear. Mark has more than 30 years of experience helping AEP and environmental firms thrive. And these podcasts deliver his invaluable management, industry, client, and HR advice directly to you, free of charge. The Zweig Letter and the Zweig Letter Podcasts let you develop professionally wherever you are. Hey, everyone, and thank you for joining Zweig Group Media and the Zweig Letter exclusive interview series. With almost 25 years of continuous coverage of the design industry, the Zweig Letter is a constant and an ever-changing marketplace. We are bringing you some of the best and brightest minds that our industry has to offer. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Wayne Wegman, CEO of Passero Associates, uh, based in Rochester, New York. It sounds like Passero, but it's actually Passero. And so I want to make that distinction for those of you out there that are looking at the name. And I said it incorrectly, and Wayne was quick to correct me, and I appreciate him for doing that. Wayne, it's great to have you join us on the Zweig Letter interview series. Um, why don't you tell the audience something very unique about your firm that is not proprietary information, but also may not be common knowledge about um, Passero Associates? Uh, well, thank you very much, Randy. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and, and be on this program. Um, I, I think what may not be common knowledge about our firm is really how we, how we grew over the past decade, actually about 15 years. And... Uh, That was when we got into uh, what I call a niche market of airport consulting. Uh, We started representing some local airports uh, in our regional area. We began at the Greater Rochester International Airport doing landside work, Uh, but then developed a a knowledge of the airport industry and the funding programs, the AIP funding program. And now we work at over 40 airports and six states now we just uh, we just were selected in indiana which is the sixth state in which we represent airports so that that's that's really how we started to grow and and reach out beyond the rochester monroe county market okay what was the impetus for that was it just that specific first job that you did and you just said him this was fun let's just move in to see what else we could do as far as that was concerned? Uh, yeah, it was. It, it, it was an introduction to that industry and, and how airports operate. And and then um, from that, uh, uh, we developed actually a strategy to grow that market. And uh, through that, we picked up about four or five airports in New York were picked up. We were selected to work at four or five airports in New York. And then from there, we grew. Okay. All right, good, good, good. Well, I mean, uh, I think I think that's really exciting. When I, I was reading about that and I saw that information, I said, "Man, you guys have really, you know, you've made a way." And I mean, I've been to Rochester before, and of course, we know the history of the of this of the city. And you know, at one point in time, there was a very large company there. Actually, there've been several large Fortune 100 companies that have been based out of Rochester, uh, New York, and it's a beautiful part of the country, beautiful part of upstate New York, and. Um, it, it's it's interesting and it's always exciting to see firms that are kind of rekindling that entrepreneurial spirit that has actually existed in, in, in the town of Rochester for more than 100 years. So, uh, and I'm sure you feel that way. I, I do. I mean, the spinoffs from Kodak, Xerox, and Bausch and & Laum uh, created a lot of small business. It brought intellectual capital to our area. And uh, as a result, I think this area has been stable at least from an employment standpoint, because of that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So listen, the first thing I want to do, obviously, is I want to really congratulate um, Passero for receiving a Hot Firm Award at our annual Hot Firm event, uh, which was held just in September in Phoenix. Um, th- that That is a tremendous achievement for your firm. And so, you know, I know, I know you guys are probably excited about uh, that award and, and what it means to your organization. But have you thought about how you you were hoping to leverage that that uh, acknowledgement? Uh, well, uh, yes, we do bookmark um, our collateral now with uh, being a hot firm. Um, and what what we feel is probably more important is uh, being a, a best firm to work for. We were in uh, 2014 recognized by you as a 
number 16th, and then last year, number 15. And that, that we really coveted that award, and uh, we really uh, we, we really communicate that because that's what it's about in, in terms of what I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys are about, about 85 people right now. That's correct. And, and you've got offices in, uh, up in Rochester. You've got, um, I know you have a Florida. Uh, where mm-hmm. are your other locations? Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, two offices in Florida. We have an office in Rochester and one in Albany, New York. And we also have an office in, um, in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. All right. So, I mean, with, with, with the, you know, utilizing that leverage of the best firm to work for, and obviously for those that aren't aware, our best firm to work for program, we, we basically send out a survey um, to the employee. So you as the firm, uh, as the leader, you, you don't necessarily get to, um, you know, cajole or, you know, encourage someone to respond one way or the other. It's a total, total blind survey that we do with the employees of a firm to really get the skinny on how a company operates and what they're doing successfully, what's working, what's not working. We ask people to be as transparent as possible. And then we grade companies based on that information that we received. And so based on that grade, uh, obviously your firm uh, won uh, a best firm to work for award in your uh, organizational category, which I think is tremendous because again, you know, we have a lot of people that respond to that uh, best firm to work for pro, um, uh, um, award, but not everybody gets it. And so it says, it speaks volumes to your organization and a testament to you as a leader um, that you, you have people that feel so strongly uh, about the culture and about the organization. And so, you know, with that said, talk to me a little bit about how important culture is uh, within within a, a firm like yours, where you started in in Rochester, but now you've expanded out, and so you've got you've got these locations in Ohio and Florida and elsewhere, and and so it's it where where once you could literally walk around and touch everybody in the firm, that's not as simple anymore. And so, what do you what have you done to preserve that culture um, there in your organization? Well, um, it it. it our size of 85 people uh, with uh, five offices, it, it is possible to touch all of them, uh, all our employee base. Uh, but I'll give you an example. We have, um, in the end of January, we'll have our annual stated, State of the Firm address. And we hold it here in Rochester because that's the majority population of our, of our employees. Uh, but we fly in the rest of our office uh, employees from Florida, from from Ohio, with their spouses, and make a two-day event out of it. And we feel that's you know that's well worth the investment because it really helps the employees get connected and more than just a work environment, but in a social environment. And we get to rejoice on things like uh, Zwei Group's uh, best firms to work for, and we and. Uh, so it, it's it's all good, but uh, we think it's more. Our focus is more on employee engagement uh, than perhaps employee satisfaction. And by that, I mean um, getting employees together and uh, and having them spend time. Yeah, talking with each other. And yeah, that's true. So no, I, I think that's really awesome, and I think it's it's important uh, for firms to hear that because. You know, we, we, we're always encouraging companies to, to bring all their people together when and where possible. I mean, we've got clients that have, you know, 1,300 plus employees at 50 locations. That sometimes can be different, difficult. And so uh, when, you have a, when, you, when you have, like you say, 85 people, and I'm assuming that you get around to those different offices fairly frequently, or at least a lot of the leaders in the organization do. But I think mm-hmm. it's just important for people to kind of hear that, that there's something to be said for bringing people together at least once a year and maybe when possible, even more. Um, I know right here at Zweig, back in the day, we were able to uh, bring people together. Um, apologize, my phone's going off. We were able to bring people together twice a year. We would bring them together um, at the end of the year as an acknowledgement of how we had done for the year and just kind of a pep talk for the new year and what all, all the lines of business and what their plans were. And then we also did a summer 
get together, which was um, even more fun. We'd have like water fights and, you know, we, I mean, we'd just pull out all the stops. And, and, and that to me, like you said, is, is a type of engagement that we're not, we don't see enough of in the design industry. And I think it's important to preserve and maintain and grow that culture uh, is to have that type of engagement with your employees. So it's also, I think, um, important to uh, uh, to understand what employees want and try to provide that in the work environment. Uh, for example, we have several employees that um, don't work your typical 40 hours a week, eight to five, um, especially, uh, you know, young mothers um, who, who um, come in and sometimes work 35 hours. I know someone who works 30 hours. Uh, some, some of our people take Friday off. And we, we try to accommodate that. Um, so, um, uh, you know, that's, that's I, I guess it's probably cliche to say this, uh, but our only asset are our employees. And, uh, and we try to really focus on them and satisfy their needs. And I, and I think it's important. I mean, you, you, you stated it correctly, and it sounds like, um, without me even asking, you, you guys have decided that um, you want to give your people the flexibility, A, that you trust your employees to get the job done, right? And then mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that, that, uh, that you're giving them the flexibility to do what they need to do, because we all understand the, the, the I would call some, some way the, the, the blurring of work and home, right? Because, you know, we've got these devices right here and I'm holding up my cell phone and this, I can respond to a client 24-7. Uh, I'm always accessible. And, you know, it's that idea that, you know, if, if you are always on, one of the things that you would hope for from an employee perspective is that your employer would give you that flexibility to not, you know, be micromanaging everything that you do because you are getting your jobs done and you're taking care of what needs to be taken care of. And, and you don't have to worry about, um, you know, all the other factors that are involved with the process. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another example, Randy, is uh, uh, in our Dayton office, Dayton, Ohio office, we have three individuals that live in the Cincinnati area. Uh, so we opened a remote office in Cincinnati, which really isn't their home base, but it allows them uh, during times of inclement weather or, or for other reasons to have a, a base to work out of so they don't have to take the our commute to get to Dayton every day. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, because Dayton and Cincy, yeah, they're not terribly far apart, but it is, it is. Yeah, it's, it's an a hour. Drive. Yeah, it's a definite It's an hour drive, each way. So, yeah. I guess if you live in a uh, metropolitan New York area, that's nothing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But here in Rochester, where you're 20 minutes from anything, yeah, that's a long haul. It is a long haul. It is a long haul. So, well, that's good. I mean, you know, so, you know, in that, in that vein, is do you think that has attributed to you your, um, um, it's a direct attribution that your flexibility with the work environment to the factor that you've been able to grow your organization by 40% organically, uh, organically, which is something that I read somewhere. And it's basically, I think it was in a Zweig letter article, but I think that's astounding. I mean, and, and, you know, my background is in recruiting and, and, um, um, executive search work. And, and I, I got to tell you, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, that really is. Yeah, we, we are proud of it. And yes, it does, I believe, have a lot to do with the culture that we have here. Um, uh, because you need a good talent. You need the professionals to be able to grow, to serve the clients. And I, I won't underestimate uh, how much of a factor the economy is, obviously, in growth. Uh, but we, we've done it, and uh, we've done it by reputation and by providing good product and and serving our clients right. So, uh, yeah, we, we've been very blessed uh, to, to to have that type of growth rate. That's awesome. And, mm-hmm. So, do, now, so tell me this then: um, Do you offer a referral bonus for employees that refer other employees? We do. All right. Is uh, that is do. that explored quite quite vigorously with some of your people? Or? Uh, yeah, it is. You know, um, it, it's. It's it's best to know who you might be, or at least have a firsthand reference to whomever you might consider employing. And we feel it's a win-win for for the employee and and for us. Okay, all right. Well, that's good. So, yeah, I mean, it it certainly does help. Um, you know, and 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 like I said, I mean, 
nowadays, uh, firms need to go above and beyond to do whatever they can do to uh, engage the employee wherever they are and, and really encourage them to grow within their profession. And, and so with that, with that said, and I, and I do want to come back to this whole idea of, of the unique things that you guys are doing um, to kind of help your firm grow. But talk to me a little bit about this whole idea of just continuously learning, because when I read that statement about you and, 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 and why you consider yourself a continuous learner that, you know, there's nothing, you know, like they say, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And I'm not calling you an old dog. I'm just saying, I am an old dog. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, if, if you're not learning, I almost feel like there's a part of you that may be dying inside. And, and, and I'm constantly looking forward uh, to learning as much as I can, and I'm not letting uh, allowing age to define, you know, where where I stop learning. So, mm -hmm. um, talk about that a little. Well, bit. it's 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 probably has to do with the progression of my career. I, I started with Pastoral Associates in '77, and then became a partner in '86, and then in the late '80s we got into the uh, early '90s. We got into the airport business, so I engaged in that. But I think. Um, where I really learned the value of, of learning and the necessity to learn is when I became president in 2005. You know, I'm an engineer, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a business leader. And I had a lot to learn uh, to, to make that transition successful. So um, I, I seeked outside help. I got coaching. I went to leadership development uh, courses. I belong to Vistage right now if you've heard of that organization. Um, and I, I, uh, I agree with you, Randy. You, um, you know, as, as soon as you stop learning, uh, you really quit providing value at a leadership level to your company. And, and so I, I'm a big proponent of it. Uh, I'm, you know, and I'm a, I'm a slow learner, so I got to constantly, I got to constantly be learning and constantly seek out advice and help and, and so I do. Yeah. Well, you know, I always tell people, and I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's important to recognize that, you know, it, it, and this, you know, like your father or maybe my grandfather might have had a different experience when it comes to that learning process, meaning that they, you know, they physically have to go into a building. You and I can pull up our cell phones and we've got the world at our fingertips now. Um, I, I'm constantly watching a YouTube video on how to do anything, whether it's something related to work or it's just how to figure out my Nest thermostat at home. You know, it's just there's just so much information out there that's available to us nowadays. There's almost no excuse. Um, and, and so I, I certainly encourage people to take advantage of that. And, and, and it sounds like that certainly is something that you believe in very strongly. Uh, with that said, do you have some type of Passero University there where you train your people? What does that look like? Uh, yeah, we, we have what we call Passero University, which are lunch and learns and they're more technically focused. Uh, but three years ago, I, I uh, developed an institute at a leadership development program. It's called PAL, P-A-L, Paso Associates Leadership. Um, and we took our, um, our manager level, director level, and went through uh, a five-month leadership development course. We had five different curriculums once a month. And at the beginning, it was to focus on self, uh, self-assessment, self-improvement, and, you know, we, did, we had a marketing um, a curriculum to it. Uh, and so we, we, it turned out to be more successful than I envisioned it would be. And, um, and uh, the, the participants really appreciate it. So then we've gone down to the next level of leadership, our management level, you know, our project managers, and taken them through a similar course, maybe not exactly the same. But every year we want to take a group of people and, and take them through a leadership development course. It also includes uh, firm operations, firm finances, things like that. So, um, yeah, we, we found it to, to be very helpful. And it is part of employee engagement. I, I, I think employees that get selected uh, are, appreciate that, um, become more engaged in the company and, and learn as an outcome. Okay. Well, that's cool. So 
there was another thing that you shared uh, as I was reading this article about you, um, and and I thought it's not so much an alarming statement as as much as it is something to really get you thinking about the you know the state of the design industry as it pertains to to labor and talent. But you said that we need to prepare for a labor shortage in the next ten to fifteen years, and. I've been kind of screaming that to the mountaintops for a while now, but but I'm just curious from your perspective, what what do you think is going to happen, and and, and what is and 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 I should I should I should reference the fact that that statement was made, and then you talked about the importance of connecting with this next generation of of talent that's coming out of school, the the quote unquote millennials um, that we we talk about uh, ad nauseum. But uh, but I think it's important that firms need to understand how to deal with that. So what what is your what is your your general thought on that? Well, you know, I've, I've been I've learned that within three to five years, millennials will be the majority uh, 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 population in the workforce. And, and they, quite frankly, uh, tick a little different than I do. And uh, I think it's important to understand what engages a millennial. And and given the demographics of our of our nation in terms of the baby boomers are retiring uh, the population rate is below 2.1, uh, you know, 2.1 children per family, that there are going to be less people in, in the workforce. And it's estimated that in 10 years, there will be a shortage of labor talent. In 15 years, there could be a shortage of actual labor bodies. So I think right now, um, Recruiting and recruiting good talent is critical to our firms. I believe if we wait, uh, uh, we'll be on the short end of being able to to grow and recruit talent. Yeah, I, I think that's important. You're absolutely right. I, I'm curious, are you doing anything even at the high school or junior high school level in your local area when it comes to like STEM programs and things of that nature? Uh, we do. Uh, we invite, uh, we do mentoring programs. Uh, we have a very active um, um, internship program, but I think a lot of firms do that, and that, that's very healthy. But we we um, we are very engaged in our community when it comes to um, you know when it comes to helping out um, non for profits in our community. So, the city of Rochester uh, has a real problem with poverty. And uh, the graduation rate in the city school district, not the greater Rochester area, but the city school district is, is around 40%. So we go out seeking uh, students in the city school just to get them an idea of what a professional atmosphere looks like. And hopefully uh, I get them you know, uh, uh, interested to some degree on, hey, you know, maybe I wanna be an architect or an engineer. You know? uh, uh, it's a small step, but but we try to do that to give back to the community. And, and you know, I firmly believe that corporate culture is a strategic asset in terms of recruiting people. So we, we try to focus on that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So what, tell us about... Um, Let's see. What, one, the other thing I wanted to mention, and, and I know you talked about it in that article, uh, that interview, is you talked about the foundation for your organization. It, can, would you mind just kind of sharing with us the the four cornerstones, if you will, of uh, Passero? Yeah, um, we about ten years ago, uh, we we the partners along with some consulting help actually developed what we call the strategic framework to our company. And we identified what's what's important to, to us. Um, we, we identified, of course, we, we developed a vision statement and a mission statement. But then we um, we looked at, uh, uh, we developed our, our five core values um, in which we uh, practice and, and try to live by. But then we um, said, let's look at our critical success factors. What, what, what helps us become successful? What, what's critical? And we identified four cornerstones. It's our best people, work environment cornerstone. It's what we call exceptional client service. It's outstanding results. And then it's growth and profitability. Our focus, quite frankly, are on best people and exceptional uh, on three of the cornerstones, I should say. And the uh, client service, 
the you know focusing on our people, and then also our outstanding results. Growth and profitability, I firmly believe, is an outcome of focusing on those three. And, and we, um, we, you know, we 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 develop the core competencies of what uh, of what we want from our people based on those cornerstones. Um, and I believe, you know, it, it, I could be honest with you, it took me a little while to really wrap my arms around this and the importance of it. But I firmly believe that that this has really helped us grow and be successful. Okay. That's exciting. Well, I mean, I certainly, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like you guys have, have really have it together and, and it, 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 you know, it, it looks like the future is going to be bright for uh, your organization. Um, is there anything that you guys have planned in the next couple of years? Uh, any potential offices that you might open or uh, any other big plans that you guys are working on? Uh, well, um, you know, we we don't open off it. We don't. We haven't. I should say strategically. Strategically, say we want to open an office here because the market looks good. Right. We we take an opportunity in the market, uh, develop a client, and then open an office from that. I believe um, that over the next uh, uh, three years, that we'll probably open an office in Georgia um, because we're starting to develop airport clients in Georgia, and I, I think that that will that that will be the impetus for us to open an office there. Okay. Now, are you? Is there? What's the largest size airport that you guys have worked on? Just out of curiosity. Well, um, uh, Greater Rochester International Airport, Albany International Airport, Dayton International Airport. Uh, but you bring up a good point. Um, uh, we, we don't. Our focus and the majority of our client base are smaller general general aviation airports. Um, they are all. All of them are part of a regional system of airports that are funded by the FAA through the Airport Improvement Program. So those grant fundings provide 75 to 95 percent of all costs uh, of improvement. So um, it's it's a nice market to be in. Uh, we they're long-term clients. Uh, every year we get projects, uh, but we focus more on the uh, smaller airports, and not the big boys, AECAM and so on. Go after the, the LAXs and the Port Authority of New York. Well, it's like it's like I always say, I mean, there's a niche for everybody. And once you find yours, you need to figure out a way to thrive within that niche. And, you know, you can you can do really well, as you guys have have uh, have shown. So I think that's that's awesome. So, well, well, listen, I know we've talked a lot about your organization, but we want to lear learn a little bit about about Wayne and, and who. Wayne Wegman is, and I've uh, got a couple of simple questions uh, that we'll end our interview with, and hopefully we'll have some fun in the process. Um, okay. What was the last book that you read? Uh, I, I read, uh, what the heck did I read? Um, I read Peter Thiel's book, uh, which is Zero to One, and the only reason I read it is uh, uh, to, to get a little better feel for uh, what engages millennials. Uh, my son-in-law is doing a startup company, and he's from that mindset. You know, he's in his late twenties, and uh, and um, so I thought, you know, it'd be a, a book to read about uh, and try to understand a little bit about the millennial mindset. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, well, Peter Thiel is an interesting individual, and and I would say that um, obviously he has kind of established himself with PayPal, and and uh, but it, it'll be interesting to see how his uh, business model um, continues in the next couple of years when other competitors come out and give him a run mm -hmm. for his money. So, but that's, that's good. What, where did you go on your last vacation? Uh, our our uh, last vacation, we went to Dominican Republic. Um, yeah. We, uh, uh, we, we go to an area in the Dominican Republic that's uh, not the Punta Cana resort area. It's more of a Dominican town. It's it's really a nice little area, and we like going up there. Okay, so you've been there before. Yes. Oh, okay, awesome. Very nice. Very nice. Well, yeah, it's. it's I'm sure because you guys have snow on the ground up there right now. Uh, not right now, but we did the, two days ago. Yeah, I saw. I saw on the news. I was telling my wife, and I saw on the news that man that that uh, like um, 
upstate New York got hit with some snow right before Thanksgiving. And I was like, yeah, oh, there did. you go. So that's yeah. why I moved from the Northeast. But, uh, but man, I hope you guys uh, have, have a, a mild winter, although they're, the weather forecasters are not saying that. So, you know. Uh, no, they're not. Yeah. They're not. And <laughs> so, the, snow, the snow fell before all the leaves were down. Right, right. So now I got a yard that's got oh, a bunch of man. wet leaves. On. Oh, that's no good. That's no good. <laughs> so, well, I wish you a lot of luck with that. So okay. um, my last question would be, if you could binge watch one TV series, old or new, what would it be? Well, what have I? Uh, Breaking Bad, I, I oh. binge watched. Okay, okay. <laughs> Everybody's uh, tried to get me into that. I, I, I have not done it because I know my, my, I know the type of person I am. I, I would probably start watching it and never stop. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had a, a meniscus um, orthoscopic surgery on my knee, and came in and watched seven episodes in a row. Wow. That's seven hours. Wow, that is. <laughs> that's I a know. little. That's, that's a, a little lot. much. That's a but, lot. Yeah, but you it's that engaging of a series, at least for me, it was. Yeah. What 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 about Walter? Do you identify with? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I that's, know. that's Brian Cranston's character on the on the. Yeah, uh, right. I, I realize. Yeah. yeah. So uh, hopefully not the one where he broke bad. Okay? <laughs> that's it. So well, before everything went went south. He was a science teacher, right? So yeah, he's a science was, teacher yeah, and trying to yeah. help his family out, but things did go south. They did go south. I can imagine. So, well, listen, man, I really, really appreciate it, Wayne. I mean, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us on this Wide Letter interview series. Uh, I'm sure we'll find time at some point in time to get you on the f- show again in the near future. And so thank you so much for coming on board. Well, thank you. It's actually an honor uh, to be on your show. And I appreciate the time you've taken to, to oh, talk. To a- absolutely. And, and listen, folks, as a reminder, all Zwei Group media programs like this one are available in both podcasts uh, and video format free for download. That's right. I said it free. You can get it on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, just to name a few places. Um, And we'd like to thank you for watching this uh, on video or listening to the podcast by offering you um, a free subscription to the Zweig Letter for six weeks. Um, Just visit freetzl.zweiggroup.com. That is freetzl.zweiggroup.com. A link to all of this information will be in our show notes. Um, and we would love it if you would share this link with a friend. Uh, We really appreciate you guys so much. Uh, I'm Randy Wilburn, and you've been listening to Zwei Group Media, part of Zwei Group. Remember, we exist to make you more successful. Thanks for tuning in to this special edition Zwei Letter podcast. We hope that you can apply Mark's no-holds-barred advice to your daily professional life. For a free six-week subscription of the Zweig Letter, please visit freetzl.zweiggroup.com to gain more wisdom and inspiration, in addition to information about leadership, finance, HR, and marketing your firm. Subscribe today.